This show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their Pitchrite pouches are jam-packed with 200 billion fresh yeast cells guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial Yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers in Portland, Oregon, who live to help brewers learn more and ferment better. Join our recipe-receiving Patreon groups and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial Yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and come brew with us. Entertaining Entertaining shows shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Pearl Media Media Network. Welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. I am your host, Joshua Stubing. Today we're doing another installment of our Homebrewer Showcase where we're interviewing homebrewers across the world to learn more about them and their brewing adventures. And today I'm joined by Mr. Coulter Wilson. He's an avid home brewer and is the host and creator of the Home Brewing DIY Podcast, a show that covers the DIY aspects of home brewing. And it's just a really cool show that you could check out. I I, um, I, I don't remember Coulter. We'll get into it when you launched it and all that. But um, I've been listening to you. I think I saw you on Reddit is when you first posted, where I first saw you post about it. And first off, dude, I'm jealous that Reddit took to it. Reddit never tapes to me. What's up, guys? How come Reddit hates me? But anyways, thank well, you for coming on. I, I could speak to that a bit, a bit. So thanks, Josh, for having me. I I think it's because I've been talking to and engaged in that Reddit forum probably since 2013. And so I'm just well known on that that forum in general. And so people tend to take to it. And, and Reddit's finicky like that. It's it's a finicky beast. It is. And I and I've tried I try to walk the edge because I I know because I've been a child of the internet. I'm 35 years old. I think I've been on the internet since I was seven years old, right? And, and I've been in bad places on the internet, man. We're talking like <laughs> faces of death internet. But anyway, uh, we, I, I know how I know etiquette, right? So I know like, oh, you don't go on there immediately from day one and go, Self-promotion, self-promotion, self-promotion. And I know and Reddit is uber sensitive to that. So I've tried to be like, I'm only gonna go on and answer questions. And then if it's a relevant episode that I can link to, I'm gonna do that. And I did that once and then someone messaged me, we took it down. I was like, oh. Yeah, it, it has to do with when you go on to Reddit, you have to be really engaged in the conversation. And I I've known those mods on there for a long time. I've actually never met them in person, but we've talked back and forth. And it's almost to the point where I was on the ramen subreddit and the mod from the homebrewing subreddit hops on. He's like, oh, hey, I know you. Let's talk about this ramen you made because I am also into making ramen noodles as well. I love, I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's just like the Reddit. If we had to, if we were judged off of the subreddits we subscribe to, We'd all look really weird to most people, I, I think. I'm surprisingly not that weird because there's some weird things on Reddit. And I'm pretty normal. Mine are generally geared around homebrewing. My hobbies are usually what's in there. It's homebrewing and cooking. And generally, that's like my subscriptions, news, that kind of stuff. So I'm pretty normal, actually. Oh, yeah. Me me too. Very <laughs> 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 no, Reddit. I, I know. I I remember when Reddit first came out, and I complained because I was like, uh, well, I, I like going to an individual forum's website for every little niche topic I'm into. What is this whole one hub for everything? That seems way too convenient. But now I'm on. I'm addicted to it, man. I'm on. I'm on my phone all the time, all day, every day, just just looking at stuff on on Reddit, trying to figure out. Uh, 
you know, like, oh, look, like I'm, I'm subscribed to one about like interior design. I don't look at look at my place. I don't interior design, but people post such cool photos. I'm like, oh, I, I want to look at this. That's what I want to spend my time doing. I also, my wife thought it was so funny. I just have to bring it up real quick. So there's one called Battle Stations. I don't know if you've ever seen that one for, for computer builds. And I posted one of my setup and that's the most interact. That's the most light I've ever felt with probably a bunch of 20 somethings and teenagers who all think I'm cool now. So yeah. I, I made the front page of Reddit for a question about my dog. Did so, you really? All yeah. right. Nice. See, Reddit. It, who who would have thunk, right? <laughs> but anyway, I did not bring you on to talk about Reddit. I want to talk about you. My friend, we we kind of connected recently. Um I forgot which episode you had posted. You've been having great guests on your show. I love the concept of your podcast, Homebrewing DIY. Uh, I think, you know, I'll let you speak on it, like starting with like uh, your history as a home brewer and, and how the podcast came to be. But I just want to say up front that I love the concept because it wasn't really a podcast geared specific to what you're doing, which is like, you know, Todd and I and James always joke about how engineer type homebrewers are. And and that is a very broad statement, but under that umbrella of broadness, it, people know what we're talking about when we say that ingenuity. Uh, a lot of you know, James calls it MacGyvering. There's a lot of guys who are like, oh, I could buy that solution, or I could make it, <laughs> and and I could. And there's a whole lot of rabbit trails we could go down. I'm sure in just what you cover. But let's start with like you and your history as a home brewer, and then what kind of led to starting up the podcast, Homebrewing DIY. Yeah, so my history as a home brewer, my first ever batch I brewed was in 1998. I had barely turned 21. Somebody gave me a, a Cooper's can of, it said IPA bitter on it. And I'm like, what's this IPA bitter? I didn't even know what an IPA was at the time. I was a Bud Light drinker, just like everybody else. Yeah. And so I took it home, read the instructions, and it seemed pretty easy. It was an extract kit. It was hopped extract, if, you, if, if you've seen those before. You don't even have to add hops to it. You just basically boil it, ferment it, bottle it, and it's good to go. And at that time in the 90s, homebrewing was a lot harder than it is today. It was you, you didn't have things like star sand that make sanitation so much easier. You had to use iodine for everything. Like you're cleaning bottles and you use iodine. You have to rinse them. You have to, there's a lot more when it came to those types of processes, and it was a, a much harder process. And I brewed a couple batches with these cans and my beer just frankly wasn't very good. Just kind of how things are. And then I went into the restaurant business and I worked in the restaurant business for about 11 years. And my entire time through that process, I kind of got away from home brewing because I was really close to... I, I was a bartender for a long time and I, and I worked a long time in the beverage industry. Randomly, I ended up as a wine buyer. So I was very into wine in that, that decade. I, I actually am. A, I would say I'm not a wine expert anymore, but there was a time when I would probably co have considered myself a wine expert. <laughs> but now going into home brewing, I had kids and got married, got a house, got it, got a day job, and at that point, around 2012, I just kind of said, "Hey, I'm going to get back into it," and went and just bought a beginner kit, went down to my local homebrew shop in Salt Lake City and purchased an extract kit. And it was a lot easier of a process this time. Things like star sand, I can't even tell you how, how much easier thing, chemicals like star sand and those no rinse sanitizers are in when it comes to creating a easier brew process. But the idea is that I went through that and just started making beer. And the, that was, I, I went through the process, bottled one batch, Hated that, went bought a kegging system. <laughs> like, turned around the next day, went down to my local homebrew store and bought a regulator, two kegs. I had a mini fridge, threw them in and picnic tapped it for a couple months and then built myself a keezer. And that's kind of where I started getting in. That was my first real homebrewing DIY project was building a keezer. And that's when I started seeing that there was this whole world built around it. And it wasn't just forums at the time. This is when GitHub starting to get big. This is this is where we're starting to get streamlined into an open source world. I've always been into open source computing and, and technology. I'm currently in tech cells. I'm, I'm a tech person. And that's how I really got into 
these DIY projects. And, and my first real big DIY project was I built myself a brew pie. And, and this was back in 2014. And there was a homebrew talk forum thread where it was build yourself a fermentation controller on the cheap. And that fermentation controller on the cheap, I was online just last week talking to somebody who had found that exact forum thread and built a BrewFi controller still to this day. And it's 2020. No way. I yeah, love the internet, man. I love it. It's like evergreen, right? As long as those servers don't go down. Uh, totally. <laughs> but, but that's, that's where I started getting to it. And then I started really getting into soldering and building electronics for myself. And that was a whole side project. I started building temp sensors for my house. It turned into a whole thing. But I always followed things like the iSpindle project that's out there. I followed Craft Beer Pie. And it's actually, because it was open source, has driven a bunch of other temperature controllers that are geared around the, the, the fermentation process and controlling that. And then there's also now... Craft Beer Pie, which is a Raspberry Pi based uh, entire brewery controller. And that is really been taking off. And he's built Man Manuel, who, who's been on the show, has built an entire ecosystem around that to where people can build plugins to automate their brewery even more to the point of like they have hop droppers on it so that you don't even have, you can step back and let the machine actually put your hops in the boil for you. I'm not that extreme, but the point is, is that, yes, when you talk about the engineering and the ingenuity of the homebrewer out there right now, a lot of them have that background. When you look at the demographics, I've, I've taken a lot of the surveys. Guys will pop into the, the forums that we talk to online a lot and go, hey, I'd like to find out who's into homebrewing and what your kind of demographics and where you come from. And I can tell you the demographics of your average homebrewer is male. Usually, which, which I actually think sucks. I, I really wish there were more women who homebrew. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. But it, it tends to be male, tends to be somebody who owns a home, has a house, has a space to actually homebrew, and actually has a decent enough income to, gener to actually invest in the hobby. Even though we do a lot of things ourselves, it's not an inexpensive hobby. Uh, just a, a base beginner setup kit's a hundred bucks, but then if you want to actually get into really homebrewing, I've invested thousands of dollars into homebrewing. I'm sure you're the same. Well, my wife listens to the show, so I don't. I think I've only invested like twenty bucks, man. I don't think it was. <laughs> I don't think it's been that much. Uh, no, she knows because I've come. <laughs> we brew at my folks' place with my pop, and uh, he, I, I, my, my wife and my mother have to just guess what I spend because every other trip I come back from headquarters with like, oh, look at this in my back. I brought home this new. You know, I'm looking forward to bringing home a conical fermenter soon. That's my next purchase I want to make. But yeah, it is. It is. I like to say the same thing too to people looking to get, it, to get into the hobby is that it's not um, it's not it's an investment, but it's worth it. It's just it, it's, it can be an investment. It depends on what you want to do with it, right? You can you could get away with brewing pre hopped canned kits forever, uh, or you're gonna get tired of it because you're gonna want a little bit more control over your brew. And, and like you said, I I love you're talking about like these hoppers that were set up with um, like controllers right and thanks to the internet of all things everything now can be connected to, the, to like either bluetooth or the internet and be controlled through some sort of if this then that process right isn't that basically what you're doing when with with that kind of thing yeah so for example the brew pie setup that i created which is now progressed and i've moved it the same hardware I've moved to a different web interface called Ferment Track. And I have a couple episodes on the podcast where we talk about Ferment Track. One where I, at the very beginning, where I talk about it to a friend, just explaining what it is, because I was still at the process of figuring out my podcast. And then later in the show, I actually got the writer of Ferment Track to show up on the show. And we really did a deep dive on it and what he was thinking and why he wrote it. And that's a much better episode. And I highly recommend if you go back and look my back catalog, that's the one you listen to. <laughs> but when you, look at that progress i use the same hardware for that the the hardware for a, a brew pie setup is that you use a raspberry pi as the web server essentially you have a web server and that web server has what i want to do with this beer right so you're going to put that fermentation profile or the temperature that you want to go into it and it's also going to run the control algorithm 
when there's a control algorithm in beer pie in brew pie that is geared around a PID, which I've heard sure people understand what a PID is, but just to to get to it quickly, a PID is a type of temperature sensor that factors in the heat and cold swing to allow you to get within a tenth of a degree without variance. And what that means is when I have my refrigerator and it gets really cold, well, when the compressor stops on the refrigerator, it keeps getting colder. It doesn't stop getting colder. You you just turn the power off, but it's still in the process of getting colder. And the same with heat. If I turn on a heater and I heat up a, a, a small space, it also is going to stop heating, but it still gets warmer. The same idea is like when you take a steak off, it still cooks even after you've taken it off the grill. Same idea. Right. But the PID algorithm factors in the overshoot either way and understands, hey, I've actually got to get this fridge yeah, your temperature is set to 64 degrees, but I've actually got to get the fridge down to 62 degrees to get it to temperature. And I have to stop five minutes, five minutes before I get there. So it stops at that correct temperature. And so it, it factors in the time and all of that in there. And you get solid temperature control. Like you can't get with just like an ink bird temperature controller that you buy off the internet. Uh, and so that's what it does. And the web interface between ferment track and craft beer pie that is the only difference it's using the same software it's using the same algorithm they just have different web interfaces and i preferred the web interface for ferment track and it had a few more features in it and so i moved and didn't have to change my hardware and so that that's at least the equipment i'm using right now for fermentation and i'm in the process right now where i just got a new fermentation chamber and so i am right now swapping out from my old Arduino-based ferment track system to a new ESP8266-based version, which are just different microcontrollers that actually run the the script on your on your on your actual fridge. I'm in the process of switching that, and I'm waiting for some boards to show up. So right now, I'm using an Inkbird, and I brew in a beer, and it's swinging a few degrees each way, and it is killing me. Inside. <laughs> is, I was about to ask. I could see it on your face. You're like, oh, and I'm using it, and it's there <laughs> yeah exactly it, it is killing me inside a little bit just because i what? i don't have the temperature control i'm used to you know and i love I, I do i will say this um uh, i love that there is uh, something for everyone because there are some people who just adjust to that swing and they, that's all they know and sometimes when they you know for fermentation some of those swings can really affect your your end result um i've learned that cuz if we're on the higher end of the ferment of like the yeast temperature uh if we're actually if if what we have it set at in the fermentation chamber is varying at all and we don't know cuz we're not doing uh, super accurate readings maybe or real time readings we don't have electrons to do that it might bring out more esters out of in that beer than than we really intended to right and we go after the fact what did we do wrong? And it may not have been wrong, might not be the correct word. It just might be, oh, well, yeah, because those machines aren't as precise. I mean, they're not, uh, I don't, well, I'm, I'm using the wrong words. They're precise, but they're not as accurate or what, what I don't, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think what it is, is that what they don't factor in is the fact that yeast itself generates heat. The fermentation process generates heat. You're sitting down and I'm fermenting a beer and I go and set my fridge to be at 65 degrees. Well, the fermentation process, even though the area around it is, it's still inside the middle of that beer is going to be, as it, depending on the size of your beer, if it's a really big beer, it could be five or seven degrees warmer inside that beer than the chamber around it. And that because fermentation can generate a lot of heat you know, your average beer that you're going to make, it's going to bump it up a couple degrees, right? So I, I, I have my fridge set at 65 and that's what I'm using is my term fermentation control. Well, the fermentation process kicks in and the center of that beer could actually be 67, 68. If you're doing a pretty big beer, it could be 72 to 75 and you think it's at 65 and you don't know that there are esters being thrown off because what if that yeast its highest temperature it could be at a 72. Yep. And so those are the kind of things that you don't see when you're not getting the data coming back to you. And these kind of products such as uh, the tilt hydrometer is a great example. You get the temperature of the beer. It's floating in your beer. And if anything, 
I've heard people talk about, you know, it's gravity readings aren't that accurate. Hey, it might be a point or two off, but generally it's pretty accurate. But the big thing is, is that you get two things that you know. You know what the temperature of your beer was, and you know that that is what it was. And the other thing you know is that you know when your fermentation's done. Because it just flatlines. <laughs> and at that point, you're like, hey, it's done. That's huge, right? Knowing yeah. knowing when it's done is huge, especially for us impatient types who are just staring at a thing of crowds and you're like, I think it's done. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious. Are you, do you find yourself gravitating more towards the tech part of DIY brewing or, or all of the above and just tech is, you know, something more fascinating to talk about? I feel like tech is the newer piece. There's a lot of people. If I talk to a ho- the home brewers around me, Aaron, who lives across the street from me, guys in my homebrew club, there's there's two types of brewers. There's your old school brewer, and he's your, hey, I've got my three vessel system. I've had it this way for 20 years. And there's a lot of those guys in my club. And they're I call them the purists. They're the guys who want to brew the way a brewery brewed in Germany a hundred years ago, and that's what they're trying to recreate in their home. Yep, I there's know th- that's I know those guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's that style of brewer, and then there's brewers like me and uh, and a and a group of my friends that are geared around. Hey, we want to do things because this is what the data is telling us. This is what actually science or the processes that people are thinking about are telling us, and this is what like my senses tell us, right? Like, for example, I'm a be- brew in a bag brewer. I am not, when you go to my, my brewing system itself is actually fairly low, low tech. I, I have a, a propane burner with a bag and I actually mash and keep things within a certain range. But whereas I'm a super nutso about my fermentation chamber, I'm not so nutso about my mash temperature, right? But the thing is, is that when I, look at my brewing style every time somebody comes to me and wants to throw a pump in the mix or wants to make it more complicated in my mind i just go i don't need my process to be that complicated i also need my process to start from the beginning my brew day needs to be something that i know i'm going to hit my numbers on and then i want to have things be repeatable to me in a way and my process is repeatable so if every time i throw something new in it something gets screwed up and then I have to tell everybody about my podcast about how I screwed up this batch. And so the <laughs> idea is that my goal is to make things that are repeatable and simple and streamlined. Whereas I would totally not... There's nothing wrong with having a three-vessel system. There's nothing wrong with having a brew in a bag system. We all have our different approaches to home brewing, But to me, it's, it's I want things to be simple, streamlined, one goes to one step to the next step to the next step. And the things that I get hung up on usually have to do with what I think is going to give my beer better quality and not necessarily take up as much time. Yeah. I find people there. They, the average person, if you told them I have a way to help you streamline your grain to glass, I think they'd be, you know, into that hearing what you have to say. Right. And like the, some of those tools you were talking about, like the tilt, those guys, I need to reach back out to them. We met them at homebrew con in Portland, I believe is where it was and a really good crew, you know, and, and I hear great things about the product. I, I haven't used one. Our friends at brewer's friend uh, incorporate that into their uh, calculator. And I know that, you know, I think all of the major ones do now because people like Brewer's Friend or like Brad Smith with Beer Smith or like Brew Father or all those other types of software realize the value of incorporating streamline or, or tech that will streamline the Brewer's Brew Day, which again, I, where I'll segue in this too was things like Brewer's Friend is, I would consider, a big step in living in 2020 and being a home brewer. Having that, at, you know, I could pull out my phone. On brew day and get and have re- information at my fingertips that people like me who are bad at math a hundred years ago wouldn't have done. We just been like, uh, it's gonna ferment and uh, we'll drink it. But now we have like real data at our hands. It's a great time to be alive. Totally, I I use cloud based brewing software, and my cloud based brewing software that I use, I, I think you just mentioned it. I use Brewfather. It has an integration with the tilt hydrometer. I have the tilt hydrometer is a bit touchy though in the fact that the tilt hydrometer is a bluetooth based 
unit. And it's actually a good thing that it's a Bluetooth based unit. It's a Bluetooth low energy. And so it, I change the battery in it once every two or three years. It lasts forever. That's awesome. I could get, I could probably get 50 or 60 batches out of a single charge on a tilt hydrometer because you drop it in and it just goes. And that Bluetooth low energy doesn't use a lot of power. Whereas there's an open source project, which is the same as, which is basically the I spindle, which is a DIY version of a tilt hydrometer. And it has way less battery life because it uses Wi Fi. And so Wi Fi is a lot more power hungry. Not that either one is worse than the other, it's just they're different. But the reason I like my tilt hydrometer is that. But I have a little Raspberry Pi, and it's really cool. You can go to the Tilt Hydrometer's website. You can download a small image, image your entire Raspberry Pi with, with what's called Tilt Pi. And it's its own operating system, essentially. And it's plug and play. You slip the card into the Raspberry Pi, boot it up, and it immediately detects your, your, your Tilt Hydrometer and then can push that data to any of your cloud services. And so it could put it into a Google Sheet if you don't have a brewing software that does it. Like I know... Beersmith wouldn't be able to take a, a cloud stream. But if you have Beersmith, you could actually use a Google Sheet and still track the data on it and you have it on your phone. Whereas Brewer's Friend and Brewfather have the ability to take a live stream of data. And it's so cool. I have my batch of beer and I go into my fermenting page of it. And with my brew log of every batch, I actually have a charted out graph of what the fermentation looked like, what the temperatures looked like, what the variances were, if it swung around a bunch. And what I found is each yeast almost has its own unique arc. And so like, for example, if I use a dry yeast like SO4, it actually goes and goes and goes and then goes from like full gravity to like nothing in like a day. Like it just ferments usually within 24 to 48 hours, it's done. But like SO5, which is the American ale yeast, right? The fermentus, Mm -hmm. it will actually have a much more gradual arc and takes a few more days. But it's really crazy how each yeast has almost its own signature when it comes to its fermentation profile. And you see that data and you couldn't see it in any other way. I would like to see that. I need to I need to get set up with that. Only just, you know, we use Imperial 9 out of 10 brews. And I'd like to see if, it, if it's placebo or if it's really the yeast is going from day one. You know, like what that might look like on a chart. Well, every time I've used an Imperial yeast and I've used those hydrometers, it's still dependent on the strength. And so, for example, I, I've done some hazies with, uh, I think their, their strain was the juice. Mm-hmm. Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. And I've used that particular strain. And I love that one because you throw in those 200 billion cells and instantaneously that thing is going within six hours. But it's, it's not the how long it takes to get going. It's actually the once it gets going, how long it actually takes to chew through all the sugar. Right, right. Yeah. And that data, too, uh, not just being useful. I bet it's cool to look at. Right. Like I'm a man of aesthetics. Like I I like to pretend like I'm smart and some charts behind me would look cool and all. But it's really just the look of it. Just like I think also, too, because people would think I was smart if I had some data to pull up and like, well, you can see on that Hefeweizen we just brewed that stuff on strain. You see where it peaks right here. I mean, I would make something up, but. I want to ask you, uh, with with like people again, DIY is such a broad thing. We can't cover the whole stuff. That's why you have a podcast on the topic because we're not going to cover the whole spectrum here. But what would you say for your average home brewer? Let's say they they keg, they have a kegerator, and they brew all grain on like a cooler brew on a cooler type of system. Is there a DIY project that you find yourself in the forums or your friends? That is the most common like entry of like like for the tech side of things. Like, is there one that you would say, hey, here's a fun one to get into and maybe push them towards like an ice spindle or, or the tilt? Is that like the direction you would push someone in? I would say your first homebrewing project that I see is the number one that I, I see people doing is keezers. Yeah. Right. And that in itself, and, and I'm talking a keezer where they've maybe taken an STC 1000, which is essentially a build your own Inkbird controller. And they're a little cheaper than randomly, they are cheaper than an Inkbird itself. Right. An Inkbird is a, a, is a put together STC 1000, essentially. And I would say that is probably the best place to start. You're kind of getting used to the wiring aspect of a temperature controller. It's not going to be as accurate as like a brew pie or a ferment track or a, a craft beer pie fermentation with a PID in it, but it's a good place to start. And it's a great, you're, when it comes to like kegs, 
They just need to be cold, right? And you need to be able to set a dial and have the variance be within, hey, I don't want it to go above 37 degrees, but I also don't want it to freeze. You got to keep it in a range. And so that is a really great project to start with. And you could build one of those. I think an STC 1000, you buy an Amazon for about $14. You buy a plug you, you to basically plug a heater and a cooler into. And you wire it up. And it has a temp probe that comes with it. And you put it into a project box and it's done. And that is a really easy electrical project to get into that I think is probably the most approachable and it has no soldering. That's usually where people get stuck stumped is like once you got to bust out the soldering iron people get scared i'm glad you asked that because i was about to say that's the only thing that todd we uh we did a keyser build this week uh that i was up at headquarters on uh, tuesday i Wednesday. saw that on your instagram yeah and and i thank you for following us no one ever follows us uh we we um we did a teaser build and T- he was just so determined to make sure that the light would still work in, in the in the the door uh, the the lid rather, and it, he had to do. Uh, he didn't have to do soldering. He did some you know wire clamping this or that. But I was like, it came out in conversation. I don't know why I am so intimidated by soldering. Well, I don't know how to get over that, dude. It's not hard, but it is accurate. And I think people, when you don't understand how electricity generally works, it can be a little overwhelming. I think that soldering. Is act for me is is very easy, but I also at a time in my life when I was a kid, I was that kid who had an electric system and I did some soldering, right? And it was things like, hey, let's make this little LED light go light, like those little projects. But that is all the same, even at a big scale. The one thing I will say is that the advent of websites like PCBWay and PCB.io have made this a lot more approachable. If I actually showed you a photo of my original craft beer pie setup, actually, if we're on camera. I'm going to grab it. Yeah, please do. I would love that. This is great. I'll just say, where, where are some more props, Coulter? I want to see these. Because I don't have... My DIY stuff is like having James build something for me. And then I tell people it's mine. And they come over and they brag and dote on it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was nothing. It was easy. So this isn't going to be pretty, but... If you can see this, I'll pull the pins off of this. Uh, this was my original. Essentially, I built my own PC, my own PCB board, and I'm going to put it up to the screen here. And as you can see, that that's me soldering wires to connect to each other, and it's using a prototyping board with just a bunch of through holes through it. This was what you had to do ten years ago, and now. There are websites like PCBs.io and PCBWay where you can design one in a, in a CAD program. And a lot of guys do that and they post them up on GitHub. And you just go buy the PCB and it tells you where to put the components and all you got to do is solder them. It's super easy in comparison to having to build your own wires into the system to like connect everything. And so it is a lot easier than it was 10 years ago. But if you're in, tim- in, a, in a soldering iron... Ten dollars. Yeah, very they're cheap. I, I've looked them up. Cheap. So, so one might say then, Coulter, that it is the best time ever to be alive for a home brewer. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Uh, I, uh, I feel like any time to be alive is a great time <laughs> to be a home brewer. Yeah, you're right. Good point. Yeah, be, because yeah. in the end, there's beer. Yeah, in the end, <laughs> there is beer. It beats the alternative. That's for it sure. Does. I meant to ask you earlier that that your first project you said was a teaser. You still running that thing, or what happened to that? I am. I and I actually still have. I, I'm actually on my second freezer. So I built two keysers, but my temperature controller is still my very first project I built, which was an STC 1000 temperature controller that is runs only in centigrade because they didn't have a Fahrenheit model at the time, and it totally works to this day has been working for almost a decade that's so, gonna be a good feeling right when when you yeah. build because i i know uh people will buy things and sometimes when they want to save money they don't spend a lot and then they complain like oh nothing's made to last anymore and i feel though like if i had built something and then it didn't last i would be like yeah that made sense i'm a schmuck but but when it lasts i'd be like that's right because these american made hands did this like <laughs> <laughs> or I, I don't know the pride i'd have because i don't hardly do any diy i say that my diy is entry level like we did um 
you know, like for for digital tap boards and stuff like that. That was always my interest in the DIY side of like when we go to present our beer at Homebrew Con and I make, you know, I use very cheap uh, Kindle tablets like they're like they're the smallest form of the fire tablet. I think there's a seven inch or six inch. And, you know, I on the back end will make some uh, looping effect and after effects that will give information on the beer and then we'll we'll display it in a way on the key on the 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 jockey box basically for lack of a better term that we've been like that's my interest is the presentation side of things i love how limitless it can be thanks to cheap tech totally but there's great diy projects on that as well there's one called raspberry pints which is a raspberry pi based web server that allows you to do a digital tap list that one also has integration and I've never built this one and I've looked at it and I just, it looks like the biggest pain in the ass. And that's why I haven't built it is they actually have the ability to put flow controls in your pipes and it could tell you what your keg level is. Right. But then there's new products out like the, the Play-Doh keg, Mm -hmm. which do that in a, I think a much easier way because they just weigh the keg. That seems to me like a better solve of the solution. But the idea is that, you know, 10 years ago, that's when that was out. Yeah, it's been out for probably 10 years. And you could, you know, build a digital ca- t- tap board doing that. That's what I use. I still use a Raspberry Pints, but it just is the web server. I just go and put my la- my tap list in and I don't have what my weights or what my flow is, but it works really well. And then there's there's actually one called I think it's keg.io or keglist.io. Uh, uh, taplist.io, right? Taplist.io. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Thank you for remembering. Uh, that's actually done by one of the admins from Homebrew Talk. So if you guys are into Homebrew Talk and, and, and supporting, that one actually is uh, kind of supporting one of the admins there. He has a project that he gives it away for free. It's not like he, he charges you. You could, you know, just like our podcast, we take Patreon money. You could probably give him some Patreon money. But the idea is that he does a digital tap list that works on the Fire TV, which is great and a cheap way to get something on your TV or onto a screen. And you could go in and build a digital tap list and you don't have to have a chalkboard. And it's it can change as you swap beers in and out. And you can put images and graphics. And it's a, it's, it's a great DIY project and easy to do. And you don't have to get your hands dirty by soldering. But to me, I I would consider that a DIY project all the way. Oh, cool. Then I then I can throw that under my cap because yeah, we do we did we have a tap list account and they went uh premium, which uh, again, great because you got guys stuff costs money to do and time. Yep. And like that poor guy, he offered so much for free for so long that when he was like, Hey, I'm gonna make this feature to where it's like eight bucks a year or whatever it is, and people are like, rabble, rabble, loud noises. Yeah, the, and to me, it's like support the guys who are building this kind of stuff and getting that kind of information out there. Open source kind of is cool in the fact that there's a lot of things that are being built out there that people are you know doing for free. When you look at a industrial sized open source things like operating systems like Linux, or you look at it, it we'll use Ubuntu for an example. Ubuntu is a, a Linux based software that is a operating system. You might see it on a lot of computers out there. It actually runs on a lot of servers. They give it away for free. You, you could go put it on any computer you want. There's no way. But you know how they actually make money? Conical, which is a company behind that, puts a lot of money into services because if you decide to build your entire company based on Ubuntu, you're going to need help with it and they're going to charge you for that. And so they have figured out a way to make money. When you're talking about an individual guy in his house who's putting in a lot of work to kind of build this and support it and answer all of your questions and to go through all those things. It's kind of, that is a lot of work. It's, it's a, it, as we know, as, as podcasters, the podcast itself is a lot of work and it's something where that kind of support to these guys who build a project you love and it doesn't take much a dollar or two shows a little bit of love and it, it, it makes them feel great. And it keeps that, project alive because what is out there also is a graveyard of halfway done projects and those are the one and i'm not saying they're not there because they don't get support but the point is is that it's a lot easier for them to go to a graveyard when they're not getting that kind of feedback that supports them yeah it is uh i will i always i think i'm just a pessimist a jerk i get that out of the way people who listen know this already but every time i see brand new tech come up uh even specifically brand new tech in homebrewing i'm always like 
okay, let's see. You know, like, because unfortunately, you just never know. Like, even, um, I, I, I think it's safe to say Pico Brew is dead, unfortunately. Brewbug. We could go to Brewbug. Yeah, yeah. Brewbug is dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? I think so. Uh, there, and uh, when, when things come out, and you're like, man, that is really cool. That's going to that's gonna be great for the, the hobby. And then you fast forward nine years or seven years, and you're like, oh, man, right? you know, pouring one out. It's like, uh, it, it is, if you don't support the projects you're into, and, and I say this too, Todd and I and James are very vocal about this with local homebrew supply shops. You and I t- talked about it right before recording where – like, man, we got to support your local homebrew supply shop uh, or they're not going to be there and they, they, there won't be anything easy to replace it and everything will move to online. And you don't want to see me driving the thing to deliver your grains and stuff or, or the drones or whatever that we're going to have. Exactly. And, and and the other pieces, I'll use a good example is is the brew bug. Right. The brew bug was a it was basically a fermentation temperature. It told you temperature and gravity. It was about three hundred dollars, if they have, I remember. Wait, didn't they have two comebacks too? Didn't the brew bug try to come back again? Or uh, sorry to interrupt. I, that, no, maybe I. I don't know, but I remember it was out, and it was a cloud-based service, right? And it didn't have like you. You paid one time, and you got cloud access to it forever. But what happened was they sold a bunch of them, and then they ran out of money. And then one day, their cloud servers just got shut off because they went out of business, and everybody. Had for, went from having a brew bug to a brew dud in a day, and it didn't work. And you would call the phone number, and nobody was there. And so the idea is that you know if, if you have a business that doesn't have a process for making money, or and and one of the reasons I like the tilt hydrometer, and I bought a tilt and didn't buy a brew bug, was that the tilt hydrometer specifically, and I'm not their salesperson, I should be, uh, <laughs> but. I, I've actually never even met the guys. I should call them up and have them on the show. But the idea is that I, the reason I like that product so much is that it isn't tied to a cloud service. In it, essentially, if 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 Brewbug went out, if, if sorry, if if Tilt Hydrometer went out of business tomorrow, my Tilt Hydrometer is going to work just fine. Yep. And and they built it that way. I think looking at the mistakes that those guys had made, and so when they went to market, it was a lot easier for uh, people who had been bitten by that to just go and do it. Well, and especially in our niche, right? Where people are very uh, of the engineer type and, and they are like, wait a second, I have to depend on your service being around as long as I expect this $400 de- or $300 device to be around. Uh, I don't know. Cause that's a lot of faith, right? And then money as well. But yeah, tilt. No, they, they nailed it. If you didn't have it locally. And is that so with most of your DIY tech projects, is that the focus is like, I need to make sure I ultimately have control. Yeah, and a lot of those open source projects are are geared around that. It's like, hey, I'm going to build that. I own the data on all of this. I'm not relying on a on a cloud service. I would say that when you look at things like homebrewing softwares like 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 Brewfather and and Brewer's Friend, they've got a business model that makes money. They're not they're not overly expensive. I mean, I don't know how much Brewer's Friend is, but I know that Brewfather is like 20 bucks a year. It's pretty inexpensive. Yeah. But the idea is that those those softwares, I think, are going to be around for a really long time because they actually have a path to where they're a more profitable business and a business model that works. And so I don't have a problem with having my recipes in their cloud. And if, if they were going to go out of business, I would think they're going to tell us and give me enough time to download them in a beer XML so I could go put them back in my beer smith, which I actually own beer smith too. And I own Brewer's Friend. I actually own them all. I don't know why. I'm, I'm a geek like that. But... You know, the point is, is that you know, I, there's still a, an open format there, which is the beer XML that allows me to not lose my stuff, and and that is also a big thing. Yeah, is making sure. Yeah, you actually own your content, right? Yeah, that's what I, yeah. I, I always tell my wife nothing against Amazon, or maybe something against Amazon. Screw you, business. But anyway, uh, <laughs> every time she buys our movies just digital, I'm like, we don't own that. You just spent tw- <laughs> oh no, it's Amazon's locker. Like we don't own that. But okay, you're st- you're still the guy who buys DVDs, aren't you? <laughs> no, I just don't. Well, I'm the guy who doesn't buy Quacha because I'm cheap, and I'm like, you don't gotta. Who, who wants to watch the last of? If it's not streamable, who wants to watch it? The last event. Who cares? But no. When when Seinfeld went to, I think the Seinfeld series might be the last DVDs I ever bought, and that was like two thousand. 
and eight or two. I was like in college. I just got married and I, I got like my first paycheck or something. I was like, I'm going to go buy Seinfeld seasons one through nine. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and I'm also the dork who backed up. All, I have, I, I use plets and I back up all my media. And then when stuff started getting streamable, I was like, what the hell did I waste four weeks of my life for? But that's a whole different show. <laughs> Hey, you know what? My Plex server has been my lifesaver since we've been in quarantine. So I am not going to knock on Plex. Oh, no, all. I'm a lifetime member. Yeah, no, I, yeah. Lo- I love Plex. And I would call that a DIY of media, right? Uh, uh, it really is. It's, yeah. it's, it's build your own media server at your house. Yeah. And in and, and trying to segue all my, my nonchalant uh, or all my non sequitur conversation that I'll do on this show, forgetting that we're recording, uh, DIY is a lot more common in people's lives, I think, than we give it credit for. Like the things we'll do around the house for, for uh, streamlining or automating processes. And you realize like, yeah, DIY doesn't have to be this overbearing. Just like trying to demystify home brewing to someone who's brand new, but they're interested in it. It's like... It, it, you, you know, let me show you an extract partial mash kit. Oh, wow. That's easy. Yeah. You think that's easy. Let me show you a brew in a bag kit. Oh, that's all grain brewing, huh? Yeah. And look at all the stuff that you can do to make that recipe different. You know, you can add this uh, during mash. You can add this during fermentation. Oh, that's real neat. And then, you you know, you come in like and monitor that data with this and this, or, or even, you know, there's a lot we could cover. Like, it's really cool. Yeah, it's there's a whole world out there. I'm about 40 episodes in, so obviously there's enough content there. I do get sidetracked sometimes, and I will talk about things like beer water, right? And I I did this earlier this year. I, I'm a big lover of beer history. I love the history of beer. And if you went and looked at my my book library of, of brewing books, they're all geared around brewing history and farmhouse ales. And it's funny, I don't, I make Saisons. I don't make a lot of farmhouse ales, but the idea is I love the story behind them. And so the, I like to study that way. So there is a lot of brewing history that we do on my, on my podcast. I've had a uh, large Grisal on the show from which he's, he's, Real, he's so hot right now. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Zoolander voice. He's so hot right now. He's Lars. so hot right now. Lars is and, so hot. And I've had, uh, I, I actually have a event going on this month where I have a gentleman who his name's Rob DeSalle, and he wrote the book The Natural History of Beer. And he's a. We're going to do a live kind of Q and A session through. Uh, if you go to my website and click on the events, you could look at that. Uh, but we we do those once a month and we're doing a, a beer history one this month. He's actually a PhD and is a, is a PhD and is and works at the American Hust- history museum in New York city. So he's, he's a great person to have. And I'm excited about that one, that's but he's awesome. been on the show as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and this is a great time before we wrap it up to plug your, your show homebrewing DIY. As far as I know, because I, I did some homework, it's available pretty much anywhere, uh, yep. but, but audio only. It, it, you don't yep. uh, do video or you didn't get into video at all. Or I, I have, I do. I am on YouTube, but it, the YouTube is only an audiogram of my audio version. So if you want to listen to the podcast and you're a YouTuber, you can just search for homebrewing DIY. It will come up. All my episodes are there. I, but I don't do video. The reasoning is that my production stream, as you know, when we, we're producing these things is geared around that I do all of my intros and outros completely separately of my interview and I push it all I piece it all together so I'm not really set up to do video as well not yet you'll get there one day people want to see that pretty mug because look if this much like we're if people are coming to follow this you've got hope my friend no but you are a weekly show uh, yep. they could go right to your site, homebrewing DIY dot beer. I love the domain. Uh, I, I, I looked for a bunch of funny domains that were dot beer. Couldn't find them. So I didn't buy one. Uh, <laughs> you, you do your Instagram is my favorite to follow you on just to, you, like the, your posts that you put on there. And also I, I like Instagram for the engagement between brands or between people. I shouldn't say brands. That sounded so corporate shilly. Um, between, you know what I mean? Like it's cool seeing what other people in our space are doing in that sort of just not a whole lot of commentary needed. Here it is. Interact. Where like Facebook, I feel like we write, you know, I write a novel of stuff explaining myself on Twitter. It's not enough characters and nobody cares. Instagram's that, that nice medium for me. I don't know which one's your favorite. I would say I'm probably the most active on Instagram. I'm also very active on 
not my own personal Facebook stuff, but really the Facebook groups. There's a ton of homebrewing groups out there in Facebook, and I'm always talking to people and communicating with other homebrewers that way. I, I'm very active on those. I'm very active on Reddit. I We've talked about that already, but I am very active there. And I would say that those are my big... It, it, yes, I have Twitter. And yes, I post and talk to people on Twitter. But just like you said, I could I, I tweet out to the universe and it's like three people like it. And they're the three people I know. Yeah, my <laughs> mom and two of my kids who I'm like, how did you get Twitter? This is weird. But yeah, it is. I, I, I mean, Coulter, I appreciate your time. I'm going to do an experiment where I'm going to post this episode on Reddit and we're going to see how long it takes for me to get shadow banned. And then we'll let you post it and then we'll see how that goes. We'll see how it goes. I don't think you'll get shadow banned. I know I won't. I like giving. <laughs> I, I have a theory that there's a mod who listens to this, and every time I say something, he's doing it to troll me. And I and I I, I appreciate you if that's. The- I have I have a Reddit trick for you, and you can even say you mentioned this. The Reddit trick is post at 10 p.m. at night because all the haters are asleep. I love it. See, I was posting at like four in the morning because I was trying to get the Europeans to like me. No, uh, the Europeans hit you when you've got a few, because what happens, you post at 10 o'clock at night and the Australians bump you up. Ah, and then, and then once you've got a few votes in, people are like, oh yeah, this looks pretty cool. And then they, they actually read it instead of just downvoting. Oh, it. that's brilliant. And you know what's funny too? I don't know if you, we use Libsyn for our hoster and, and I'm getting off topic. Nobody cares anymore about this, but uh, Australia, we are blowing up in Australia this last like six months. That's a, I'm going to have to use that on Reddit now. 10 p.m. Uh, wait, yep, 10, 10 p.m. Mountain or, or, or Central? Yeah, I do 10 p.m. Mountain, but uh you're only an hour ahead of me. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Oh, I'm up. I'm up. I'm, I'm, yeah, nine I, o'clock is fine. I mean, it would be fine. It, the idea is that it has to do. You, you have to post at night because it seems that the pe- because there's no content being put on there at night. And so people are bored and then they're like, oh, hey, this is cool. And then what happens is you've already kind of got a running start when the when when people start downvoting you. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> see, there's a, yeah, you're way smarter than me. I'm just like, I'm going to and throw it on a wall and see what sticks. And it never hey, does. Coulter, ha- it, it never sticks for me. either. <laughs> Coulter, my man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. We got to work it out. Maybe have you do a and a with our guys on DIY because we get a ton of questions on some of the techier stuff. And I'm just going to forward it your way from now on. I apologize. That's okay. Love to have the conversation with anyone. Awesome, man. I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you later. And that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, you can go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on the submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsor, Imperial Yeast, for supporting us and the homebrewing community. Join any top tier of our community and get free premium liquid Imperial Yeast shipped out to you with your Patreon recipe kit. Get more info at patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour. On behalf of the absent Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening. This program is made possible by The Checkbook of Mr. Todd Burns and by contributions to our newly launched Patreon by viewers like you. Visit patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour and join our community. Thank you.